and we thank them for being here. The first speaker is John Hewson. He's an Australian economist. He's the company director and, of course, a former politician. He was federal leader of the Liberal Party of Australia from 1990 to 1994. And he took the federal opposition to the 1993 federal election. Since his departure from politics, he has written extensively in the business and general press, and uh, he spends time on the lecture circuit as well. In his writings, you will have seen that he's, uh, he's demonstrated an increasing focus on corporate, social and environmental responsibility, and it is in that vein that he, uh, he opens our summit this evening. Thank you, John. Good evening. Thank you very much, Serena, for that introduction. Uh, let me begin by congratulating Christine on her recent uh, increase in power and position. <laughs> You'll enjoy it as much as I did, but you can't believe the buck actually does stop with you from now on. <laughs> um, look, I begin by saying that I think Kevin Rudd was right, at least he was right about one thing. I think responding appropriately to the challenge of climate change is the single most important moral issue of this century. It, uh, to me, um, it's also a significant economic, social and political issue uh, about which there should be a much greater sense of urgency than there is today in our current political debate, even though we are moving towards a carbon price in the middle of this year. I mean, a number of governments around Australia are backing off it. And my old press secretary is promising to abolish the carbon price uh, when, he, when and if he wins government. <laughs> I uh, was most disappointed, I guess, in the Rudd era that uh, Kevin set out a very tight timetable with the Gano report and white papers, green papers, uh, a legislative program. And when he had the opportunity, I believe, to go to a dip of double dissolution and to force his view through, I think he actually would have won that election in early 2010, I think February 2010, and I think he'd probably still be leader. But since that point, the political constituency for the sort of response that we need to see, the urgent response we need to see to climate change, has actually waned considerably. Not helped, I guess, by the fact that in the United States, it's certainly been put on the back burner as an issue as well. I um, as one of those people who believes that we should be reducing emissions in this country by about 30 or 40 per cent by 2010, 2020, I should say, and at least 90 per cent by 2050. And uh, you can't back end load that process. You've got to front end load it. You can't wait to 2049 and wake up and hope you can cut it by 90% the following day. It's something that you have to build over time and you have to build that momentum over time. So the fact that the urgency of the issue has been lost and has certainly waned is of great concern to me. I've been involved in this issue now for um, uh, many years. I guess in the late 90s we started a group called the National Business Leaders Forum on Sustainable Development. The idea was to try and educate the business community about the tremendous business opportunities that would <coughs> arise and uh, persist in, in given an appropriate response to climate change. And in fact, that the business community to a very large extent could drive the process. We didn't necessarily need to just rely on leadership from government. Well, for the first few years we met among ourselves. Uh, then we brought Al Gore to Australia about eight years ago or so. He was dispensed with at the time as a failed politician and an entertainer. Um, nevertheless, he gave a speech in this country which we encouraged him to turn into the documentary which was an inconvenient truth. And that and a combination of factors still did with the Stern Report and other things build a momentum that, uh, you know, as I say, built up through in our country to uh, early 2010 and then it has waned somewhat since, even though we have an agreed position today on climate change. But in that process I got frustrated by the paucity of the response and the lack of preparedness by the business community. So I set out to demonstrate in a range of businesses that I initiated, uh, along with others, uh, to demonstrate that you could make a quid out of responding appropriately to climate change. The first was recycling household garbage. Uh, the second one was uh, building energy efficient light bulbs. The third was building the largest biodiesel plant in the world in Singapore. The fourth was green data centres and so I can go on with a host of other businesses that I've worked with in related, related to alternative technologies. But the tragedy is that the opportunity for what I believe could be a technological revolution in the business community has been lost. It hasn't been helped by the GFC. It hasn't been helped by the fact that most investors sit back on substantial amounts of cash 
for luck and to take the risk, and I don't care whether it's an individual through to a large-scale superannuation fund, reluctant to take the risks that they perceive in backing some of these alternative technologies and uh, appropriate business responses to climate change. I make one political comment before I make my final business comment. I am concerned, uh, I'm a very strong supporter of the fact that we are putting a price on carbon. I'm disappointed though that the government is in a sense doing itself gratuitous political harm by setting the price at 23 bucks. When the global price is closer to eight dollars, about a third of what is promised to begin on the, in July, I think we are making the political process much more difficult than it needs to be. And I'm disappointed that in fact we aren't moving immediately to an emissions trading scheme, even if that process were delayed a little bit. I think it makes sense to do it in, a, in a, as good a market structure as you can in order to determine a price on carbon. I suspect Given the political plight of the Prime Minister right now, everything from Peter Slipper going backwards for six or nine months, I wouldn't be surprised if in the budget she doesn't do something about the level of that $23 price. And that will weaken the substance of the case of the opposition against the introduction of a carbon price and will probably make the transition to a carbon price a whole lot easier. The final point I want to make is to say, you know, I'm looking forward now, assuming we have a carbon price, where to from here? I stay with the business community. I'm now chairman of a group which is called the Asset Owners Disclosure Project, which is going to be the most comprehensive survey of the preparedness of the major superannuation and pension funds in the world, the top 1,000 of them, in terms of their, the, the uh, substance of their response to climate change, their preparedness to handle the risks that they perceive in the process of climate change. And as a spin-off of that, we are going to rate these top 1,000 superannuation and pension funds. Now, they handle somewhere around 50 or 60 trillion US dollars in investment funds globally. And I would put to you that irrespective right, largely of what governments do, if those funds were to shift even as small an amount as 5% of those funds in the direction of funding alternative technologies and alternative um, and other appropriate responses to climate change, they could actually deliver the change that is required to get the sort of magnitudes of change that I've, I've referred to before. <clears throat> now, this is a very ambitious project. We're in the process now of presently uh, structuring an international board to back it. We've already done about 400 of the top 1,000. But these funds will be rate, rate, rated under four or five components of the, the overall rating. The transparency of their activities, the degree to which information is publicly disclosed uh, excuse me, <coughs> and shared with fund members and, uh, and with us. Secondly, the low carbon investment, the extent of their low carbon investments. Now many of them are heavy investors in the fossil fuel industry for example. It should be possible at the margin with this sort of rating I think to encourage them to move away from that. Thirdly, the investment chain alignment, mechanisms in the investment chain to help manage climate change risks. Fourth, their active ownership, uh, their active, uh, <coughs> excuse me, act the extent to which they're actively engaging with investee companies, shareholder resolutions, engagement strategies and proxy voting in relation to climate change, and finally, monitoring the, and management of uh, climate change risks in their investment strategies. Now, I think those five categories together will give us an overall rating, and we're going to rate them all from the top 10%, which will be platinum rated, down to the bottom uh, quartile which will be tin rated <laughs> with gold, silver and bronze in the middle. But I think it is an effective way by which we can hopefully drive the international investment community to recognise the reality and urgency of the challenge of climate change and start to get them to think about shifting their investment patterns in support of, of, of more uh, effective investments from the point of view of an appropriate response to climate change. And uh, I do think that the private sector can be a very substantial driver of this process and a personal disappointment of mine is that the business community in this country in particular but more broadly has showed pretty appalling leadership in responding to that challenge. Thank you.